sorry, unmute myself here. Thanks, Abe. So I'm Vic Wheeler. Uh, Steve has been involved in research projects uh, at Acadia for a long time and a, a, a lot of projects spanning a lot of uh, different perspectives and different portions. Um, and his study of, of physiology, evolutionary biology in herps uh, and other animals at Acadia has just been a, a, a really amazing experience for the park um, and also for his students um, where he's faculty in biology at uh, College of Atlantic. Um, I, I've been in the field with Steve just countless times that it's seemingly out of nowhere he'll spontaneously just become completely giddy and and speechless for a few moments and then um jump to the ground and start describing equations of thermodynamics um with snow with a stick as some little tiny kinglet that just shouldn't be warm flies and chitters overhead or something like that and for so many organismal biology is, is this pursuit of, of expanding knowledge. And for Steve, it's really this um, pursuit of, of joy and wonder. Uh, and, and it's the, his curiosity, um, endless questioning and, and passion about animal phenomena and how they go about this world and how they go about this business of, of surviving and, and continuing is, is something that I find uh, really unique in people, and and that's maybe only rivaled in my in my four year old. So um, with that, uh, it's it's um, it's really great to have Steve talking to us today about some of his really interesting work, um, looking at just the the wonders and amazing and weird things that that Acadia wildlife have to offer. So thanks a lot, Steve. All right, thank you, Beck. I should say that in your own Bick Wheeler way, I've seen you just as giddy out in the field. Um, and um, I'm going to take that as a compliment that I have the maturity level of a four year old. So, uh, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yes. All right. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. My screen is showing that I think there are like 28 of you there out there. And uh, I wish I could be in person, as we all do, uh, but it's still a pleasure to be with you during this lunchtime um, seminar series. And uh, what I'm gonna do is talk to you uh, and give you a broad overview of work that I've been involved with uh, in, uh, regarding a, a population of spotted salamanders in Acadie National Park. And we'll do so by uh, introducing you to the questions that I've been asking and, um, and the findings that I have so far, as I said, in a in a very broad way in the interest of time. And then hopefully I can do that so that there'll be plenty of time for questions where I either have a chance to clarify something I said or to fill in something that I omitted um, or to expand on, um, on what I have to present to you today. So I'm just gonna jump right into it. And uh, here's the title in front of you. And I should tell you that what I'm gonna go over today is work that I've been doing in the field with students and with the support of the park um, over the last five years or so. And it has to do with a population of spotted salamanders that is uh, that breeds at Otter Point. And thankfully, I don't have to spend any time introducing where Otter Point is to you. Uh, and at Otter Point, at uh, at a certain location, there are these uh, pools. I don't call them vernal pools because most of the pools retain water year round uh, that, uh, it, that are formed by water collecting in the granitic fissures at the headland right here. And uh, I have Bruce Connery to thank for uh, uh, informing me that these things existed. Shortly after I arrived at COA, I got to know Bruce and Bruce told me just sort of casually, he said, you know, you should go down to Otter Point one uh, spring because I heard about amphibians being down there. Down there, He said, I never really have gone down there, but, um, but I've heard that there's spring peepers calling by the ocean and you should check it out. And I did, and I would take students down there either as part of my herpetology class or just in the springtime if I wasn't teaching herpetology, would get some students or go down by myself 
and, um, and observe spotted salamanders uh, that, uh, that migrate there in the spring. And they do so to breed. And I would go down there with students because, or by myself, because it was a great place to observe spotted salamanders breeding. The water down there in the springtime is crystal clear. It's like watching these salamanders mating and breeding in an aquarium. And it was, and, uh, and all the while it was intriguing that they were breeding at Otter Point because over the years I was able to document that they use 15 of these poles um, to breed in. Not every year all 15 are used, um, but uh, these poles are only six meters, vertical meters above the high tide line. So when I would be down there, um, I would, uh, while down there or after I left, you know, you could taste on your lips salt because if it was a particularly foggy night or uh, kind of a blustery night and there, and there would be uh, maybe, you know, some uh, high wave action, you kind of got coated in salt. And so always in the back of my mind, I was thinking, well, you know, how, how are these salamanders doing it if indeed the water that they're in is salty and um but i never really tested that i just it was always sort of in the back of my mind but anyway a number of things converged about five years ago where i was able to start a project uh to investigate this so before i sort of delve into the details of my project i sort of want to set a framework as to why in the title i say this is an intriguing uh uh, uh ecological uh uh, setting for these salamanders. And I'm going to do so by giving you some very quick uh, sort of background on the life history of spotted salamanders and also salamanders being amphibians, what this uh, potentially means to them being at that site. So spotted salamanders are beefy, robust salamanders. They sort of fill up your hand uh, the, as an adult. And they have a, uh, the species has a very broad distribution that extends from you know, southern Canada all the way down into the southeast. Um, so widely distributed, and I know of no area or region throughout their distribution where they are state listed as a species of, of that's threatened or endangered, or even a species of special concern, because thankfully they're still common where habitat is um, still around to support their populations. The thing is, is that you don't see them that often because most of the year they're underground. The spotted salamanders belong to a taxonomic group of salamanders that's sort of commonly referred to as mole salamanders because they spend most of the year under, we think, underground in the, using the tunnels of small mammals, moles, and, you know, uh, most likely other small mammals like shrews. Um, but in the early spring, at least in, the, in northern New England, in the early spring, they emerge from their overwintering um, underground habitats to breed. So as adults, they are terrestrial salamanders, except for the brief period of time where they go to bodies of water to breed. And they can emerge very early in the spring up here when there's still patches of snow on the ground. And when they make their way to breeding poles, uh, males arrive and then females arrive Oh, shortly thereafter, maybe a few, three, four days thereafter. And then within a relatively short period of time here in, in Northern New England, they will breed. So they'll be in and out of these pools in about 10 days, maybe two weeks. And it's referred to as explosive breeding. And this video is just showing you males and females swarming among one another um, uh, in, in courtship. And this is taken down at Otter Point. And again, you can see how clear the water is. It's pretty amazing. And what will happen is that males will sense that females all around are around and they'll deposit little packets of spermatophores. Here's one just lifted from the water where their sperm is placed on a gelatinous stalk and females will come along and pick this up. And the uh, fertil fertilization of their eggs is internal, but it's internal without the male being present. And females will lay eggs in the water. Down at Otter Point, they attach them, usually attach them to uh, uh, pebbles or rocks. Um, in forested vernal pools, they'll attach it to submerged vegetation. 
uh, the eggs mature into larva and the larva then break out of the uh, gelatinous uh, egg capsule and will uh, be aquatic larval for a good part of the summer. And they have external gills, they have four feet, so they look very different than a frog tadpole. And they are carnivorous. And uh, they will uh, emerge from their breeding pool uh, by the end of the summer and then uh, undergo metamorphosis and then spend three, maybe five years as juveniles maturing into sexually reproductive adults and then will start their first migration to breeding pools. So um, water is really important to all amphibians and to this uh, particular species of salamander. When on land, it needs to keep its skin moist so that it can respire. Most of its respiration, even though it has lungs, occurs through uh, their skin. In water, uh, I'm sorry, when they go to water, wa water quality is really important. Uh, uh, especially for their eggs and larval stages because they can't leave the water. So uh, um, it's uh, uh, um, aspects of water quality, quality that would include, you know, pollutants or um, pH have been investigated because they can have a profound impact on, on those two life stages, the egg and larval stage, because they're so vulnerable. Um, but for adults, uh, water quality can also have uh, potentially uh, a big impact because of their permeable skin. So even though they're bigger and they can leave water, when they are in water, uh, uh, salamanders are really tied to the environment that they're into. And so I wanna just focus just a minute on what this means in relation to salt in the water. So just a really quick physiology lesson here that inside spotted salamanders, uh, the combination of their body water and all of their dissolved ions, the salts and the uh, uh, amino acids, everything together gives them a salinity inside their bodies of around 300 milliosmoles, which is a physiological term that refers to the amount of dissolved solutes in their body water. So you don't have to really worry about that unit, just sort of uh, focus on the, uh, on the value there of 300. So when they are in fresh water, Fresh water is around 10 milliosmoles, so it has far fewer dissolved solutes than the inside of the salamander. And I put here fresh water in equivalent um, uh, uh, units of, of uh, measures of salinity that we're more used to seeing, a parts per thousand. So fresh water is usually cla uh, classified as water that has equal to or less than one part per thousand of dissolved solutes. So anyway, we have the salamander that has a lot more salt in it than the surrounding water. And the result is, is that it loses salt to the water and it gains water. But uh, all amphibians have a defense against this when they're in fresh water. What they can do is pee a lot. So they, they synthesize a lot of dil dilute urine and they basically are avoiding that influx of water and their skin can actively uptake salt. It can extract salt from the water and actively transport it into their body to replace those lost salts. In salt water, it's a different story because of the higher concentration of dissolved solutes and salt water is around a thousand milliosmoles or 35 parts per thousand. So for the salamander to be in salt water at 300 milliosmoles, it gains salts and it loses water, but can its skin and can its uh, renal system do anything about that? And the answer is a resounding no. So salt water really represents an environmental stressor that the uh, uh, salamander, uh, or and this salamander, uh, at least if you read the literature and most amphibians have no defense against dealing with that salt load and loss of water, so sort of concurrently, they dehydrate and go into osmotic shock from all the salt that they um, will acquire. So that's why uh, it, the general characterization of where spotted salamanders breed is such that uh, when populations have a mixture of uh, mature deciduous forest along with freshwater vernal pools that represents optimal habitat because they have um, upland uh, or, or, or terrestrial deciduous forests 
to spend their 50 weeks out of the water there to eat and mature and to uh, and to have those underground burrows, and then they have their two weeks in the freshwater vernal pools to breed. And um, and if you look at the range of breeding habitats for spotted salamanders, which is more broad than wood frogs, which they breed at the same time here in New England, and wood frogs are strictly vernal pool breeders, but but spotted salamanders can breed in more permanent bodies of water, but always, if you look at the literature, it's freshwater. And um, this idea that sal that amphibians need fresh water, it you know, is it's a long-held view that really starts with Darwin. And you know, you can read his quote here where, except for at his time, he just knew of one species that was an evolutionary outlier that could inhabit um, um, uh, uh, estuary, uh, coastal regions in Southeast Asia, and even venture out into tide pools, uh, that there was something about this species that we know full well how it can do that, but all other amphibians, the way Darwin phrased it, is that they're killed by salt water. Um, and that had been held for really up until, believe it or not, uh, 2015, and I'll get to that in a little bit. So that's why I was intrigued by this population down there, is that what are they doing there? And if it's, there is salt in the water, how do they deal with that? And that really formed uh, the uh, uh, sort of the three major objectives for my study over the last five years or so. So first and foremost, I needed to quantify whether the pools um, uh, were uh, bodies of water that had elevated salinity or not. And because there were a number of pools down there where the salamanders could breed, I wanted to look at the spatial uh, variation in salinity as well as temporal variation, both within and between breeding seasons. So that was my uh, first uh, objective. And then also, if indeed there was salt in the water down there, I wanted then to try to quantify somehow the level of salt tolerance in individuals in this breeding population. Um, because uh, if they are there and they're salt in the water, then somehow they have to be able to tolerate that. But I also needed to uh, compare that to an inland freshwater population because in order to invoke some uh, uh, measure of local adaptation, then obviously I needed to compare it to other populations that are not there because it may be something inherent in spotted salamanders where they can tolerate salt and, and not necessarily um, a function of local adaptation. And to sort of reinforce whether local adaptation is uh, at work or not, I also wanted to quantify the level of site fidelity by the uh, breeding population at Otter Point. Because if these salamanders come to these breeding pools at Otter Point uh, maybe once every five years, but, but go to other pools that would be nearby, in other words, be part of a metapopulation complex, then they would not have uh, a sort of sustained exposure to salt in, in consecutive breeding seasons. And thus local adaptation, at least the forces leading to local adaptation would adaptations would be lessened. So I'm going to go through um, my um, general findings uh, as I address these three objectives in, in fairly sort of rapid fashion, um, just again in the interest of time. So what I did is that I have four years of data where I sampled um, or measured environmental salinity down at Otter Point. And, um, and in 2016, when I did it for the first time, really this part of my protocol started off with a bang because you see how I've broken up the breeding season into three distinct phases where the breeding season started out um, with uh, the pools, the breeding pools having fairly low salinity concentrations. But come April 8th, those, uh, the pools where spotted salamanders were breeding in, the salinity shot up to near full strength seawater. And the reason why is because this happened on uh, the night of uh, April 7th and during the day of April 8th, where a combination of a uh, uh, high tide and an offshore storm led to uh, uh, surf that uh, reached above um, the uh, um, average high tide line. And you see a washed 
all of the breeding pools with full strength seawater. And, um, and prior to this event, there were salamanders in these pools, like this pool right here, whoops, that, uh, that were breeding. So what happened after that was surprising to me because salamanders returned. Um, the night that I went out and measured these salinities, there were no salamanders in any of the pools. But subsequent to that storm event, salamanders returned, whether they were in the pools that I didn't see or whether they were represented a new wave of migrating salamanders, I don't know. But there were uh, salamanders in the pool and you can see the modal value for the salinities, not surprisingly, were much higher than when the breeding season first started. That storm, a, a storm event that uh, broke up the breeding season into three distinct episodes happened again in 2018. I didn't witness the storm that occurred around the 15th and the 16th of April, but I, but weather data documents that there was a uh, offshore storm from the uh, nor'easter, if you will, with um, that coincided with um, high tides and strong winds that most likely um, had. Um, uh, uh, similar conditions um, existed down at Otter Point. I didn't go down there during the storm because I remember that um, it, I stayed home because I didn't think it would be safe down there. It was a driving wind and rain. And when I went down there, the same thing where the salamanders were absent uh, prior to the storm event, but then they returned. So interspersed between 2016 and 18 was 2017 and 2019 where it was much calmer conditions down there and that uh, uh, salinity levels throughout the breeding season were much lower and much uh, narrower uh, range of salinities. Although in 2019, there was an instance where one of the pools had um, very high salinity uh, for reasons that um, I can't really um, account for. All right. so. Because of this range of salinities and the fact that I saw spikes in the field, I really became, you know, intrigued by could these salamanders be uh, salt tolerant at a level that would exceed that seen in populations that breed inland in freshwater. So I went about testing salt tolerance and I, there are lots of ways to do that and I ranked them from invasive to the most invasive to the, to the uh, most non-invasive and here uh, this not should not be surprising to you that uh, that LD50s are used where you put um, amphibians into uh, experimentally into uh, conditions uh, that would uh, represent uh, them challenged with a stressor and you look to see what the lethal dose is for 50% of the population of course you get um, you're dealing with uh, mortality there but you can see here where other measures where the uh, animal is not, um, doesn't necessarily have to be killed, where you can extract pieces of tissue and run um, activity and, and measure activity levels of, uh, of uh, enzyme activity, or you can draw blood and you can measure the osmotic concentration or levels of stress hormones. And, and I'm just gonna go down here to the least invasive, and that is that you can measure the time spent in different salt concentrations and see if that elicits what's referred to as aversion behavior. In other words, if the salamander is given a chance to leave the stressor, it will. And that's what I did. I, I, I um, examined aversion behavior in uh, salamanders from Otter Point, and I compared that to aversion behavior in salamanders from a freshwater pool. And just briefly, my uh, setup consisted of two containers, one had fresh water, fresh, fresh water reservoir, and then the experimental chamber uh, uh, cons uh, consisted of uh, water solutions that range from 0.1 point, uh, parts per thousand, which was uh, the same as the fresh water, all the way up to 50% full strength seawater. Um, and I could talk more about why I chose those uh, concentrations in the question and answer, but I'm just gonna move on here along here. And what I did is that for each one of these concentrations, I tested eight salamanders and I ran the, the uh, aversion behavior choice test concurrently. So I had two 55 gallon aquaria set up here at the college and I had four of those choice setups uh, per uh, aquarium. 
and uh, blocked out all other what I thought would be extraneous visual, visual uh, stimuli that could impact the movement and behavior of these salamanders. So this stippling here represents uh, contact paper that, paper that I put in front of the aquarium. And this represents a 25 watt dim red light. And then there were opaque dividers uh, between uh, the different um, uh, containers. And then I had a mirror underneath the aquarium. And here were some of my student observers that were looking at the reflection on the mirror. And this is, a, this is not x-ray vision that kind of looks like from this illustration. But here's what it was. It's hard to get a picture because the light was so dim. Here are the aquaria. And then here's the angled mirror. And here I had students looking at the mirror. And here's what we're looking at uh, is uh, the salamanders in these containers and whether, whether they move, oops, whether they move into the fresh water. So the goal was, is the time over 60 minutes, how long they stayed in the experimental solution. And here are the results uh, from the coastal population. And uh, here on the x-axis are the different salinities and on the y-axis is how much time they spent in the test solution um, over a 60 minute, 60 minute test period. You can see lots of scatter. I had to exclude one of the salamanders in this 17, 0.5 parts per thousand because it wasn't behaving um, what I thought to be in a kind of free will type of way. And again, I could talk about that if you had questions about that. But anyway, lots of scatter. Um, and uh, and uh, my N of eight, so if you don't see eight uh, open circles that represent individual salamander responses because there's duplication at, at a number of these uh, uh, response times. Uh, and um, then I have it for oops, an inland population. So I went out and I collected salamanders from two closely uh, positioned vernal pools around Town Hill outside of the park and uh, ran the same test. Uh, here again, the same test solutions and then the time spent. Uh, you can see less scatter, but um, then the coastal population, and, but it's still a lot of variation. So the question I was asking is whether salamanders found in certain salinities would spend less time in those salinities relative to the freshwater um, uh, test solution. And if so, then this would elicit, could potentially elicit enough aversion behavior that I would be able to detect a pattern and that could translate to what the level of salt tolerance would be. In other words, what salinity concentration is high enough that the salamanders exit that salinity concentration because they cannot somehow physiologically deal with it. And that could be used as a you know, first approximation of salt tolerance or level of salt tolerance. So I ran statistical tests. It was a small sample size and the, and the data was not normally distributed by any stretch of the imagination, even transformed. So I ran the Mann-Whitney U test and I'm just gonna jump to uh, uh, what was significant and bo for both the inland population and the coastal population, the 17.5 parts per thousand test solution um, when compared against the time salamanders spent in the uh, freshwater control solution for both the inland and coastal population was statistically significant. So just circling what was, even though that there was scatter in the coastal population, uh, salamanders spent statistically less time at 17.5 uh, uh, in comparison to the freshwater and the same held for the inland popula population. So the quick take home message here is that uh, the salamanders that breed at Otter Point do not seem to be more salt tolerant. That is be able to tolerate a higher concentration of salinity relative to that of a freshwater population. All right, so um, let me just check the time here. All right, so uh, I then um, sort of, this is all trying to make a story out of this, but this was all sort of happening kind of at the same time, but going to my third study objective of looking at site fidelity at Otter Point, um, that now took on added significance because if indeed, um, uh, Otter Point salamanders are not more tolerant of salt than that of inland popu populations. 
Could it be because they do represent a metapopulation? In other words, here they breed at Otter Point, but maybe there are vernal pools up here and up here and over here that they will, um, excuse me, turn my phone off here, um, that they will breed up here one season and come back here the following season. So they, again, it's at less intensity of dealing with a saline habitat. So um, I wanted, I addressed this by a mark recapture study and just looking at the rate of return of salamanders from year to year. And I marked them with a visible uh, implant elastomer, which is a polymer that solidifies underneath their skin. And it's used a lot in fish studies. And this is taken from their manual where you inject different colored elastomer into an area of, of animals and, uh, and it lasts um, for many years. And what I did is <clears throat> for each year, I used a different color. So I didn't mark individuals I, um, per se in that I didn't differentiate between the number of salaman between the salamanders that I found in 2017, 18, 19, other than they were there in 2017. So I have a color for each year and orange I think was for 2019. So I marked salamanders in 2017, 18, 19, and also I started in 2020 before um, all hell broke loose. And um, just run through here that of the number of the 107 that were there in 2017, I'd marked 96, and you can just see how many I marked um, in the subsequent years. I'd marked fewer in 2018, because this was the year I was doing the behavioral studies and there was a lot going on. But just show you that um, in 2018, 50, 15 percent of the 96 that were marked in 2017 showed up again to breed. In 2019, a total of 21 percent of the marked animals from these two years uh, were present in the breeding pools. And you can see here that uh, there were. Um, it was interesting that. Um, oh, down here. Sorry. And then in 2020, um, the time that I was able to spend at the study site before research was suspended, which was for the first several nights at the beginning of the breeding, breeding season. And then when I was, um, that the uh, suspension was lifted, I was able to go back and get a couple more salamanders at the tail end of the breeding season that I documented that there, were, uh, that there was 11% return from March salamanders from these three years. So the return rate dropped, but also my sampling period was greatly truncated. But I'm encouraged that um, I may be able to see um, higher returns because if you look at it a little bit differently, 17 and 15 of the 61, 61 salamanders that I was able to find in the time that I spent down there, so like a little bit over 50% of the salamanders that were present there were marked. So I'm really encouraged that I might be able to start getting more and more robust data to really look at whether the salamanders that breed at Otter Point um, show um, really high site fidelity. Um, and it may be that they will, because I have done surveys where I've walked away from Otter Point and I've walked up past the parking lot and just walked back and forth surveying for other vernal pools. And I and um, over time, I've taken it this far, then I went a little bit farther, and then I went a little bit farther and going back and forth. And I have yet to find any vernal pools up there. If you walked up there, you know, it's kind of a tangle of a, of a thick uh, spruce fir forest and very rocky, thin soils. And it just may not support any, any vernal pools. Bruce Connery told me that he thinks it doesn't because um, that this area up here has been used over time as a as in a naval antenna station. He said it was a working farm at one point. So it could be that the salamanders, this is the only pool in town down there. So I'm really encouraged to continue with that work um, and uh, in the subsequent years. So I am just going to quickly, I sort of talked about this. And again, I just want to, uh, maybe just dwell on this second bullet point for a second because <clears throat> again i'm looking at at thresholds of salinity that for both the inland and the otter point salamanders is somewhere in between this uh incremental change from going from 11.6 up to 17.5 um 
And placed in a broader perspective, I want to go uh, to this review article that appeared in 2015, and it did two things. It, it alerted those who read the herpetological literature that if you really look and delve into uh, what has been published over the years, that a lot more amphibians are found in saline water of varying salinities than what had previously been thought, that we're perhaps really not just um, um, uh, have just a few outliers that somehow they've evolved adaptations to deal with hyper osmotic conditions, but here it presents data on 144 species that have been found in, in saline lake water. But I just want to go to some of the text that they've come to the conclusion that most of the species are found in habitats where salinities don't exceed 13 parts per thousand. Think about some of those salinities that I measured down at Otter Point and that experimentally the tolerance is in the nine to 12 parts per thousand range. And so whatever my tolerance is between 11 and, and a half and 17.5 is really at the upper end or exceeds what um, has experimentally been measured in the past. So I think there is significance there, uh, even if I don't doc, if, if I don't see local adaptation, that spotted salamanders may have tolerance for salt that is higher than anything reported to date. So what does that, um, um, and just to sort of add to that here, that the lack of local adaptation, is it due to metas population status? I don't think so, because I think that's, as I said, that's the only vernal pools in town. And so why is that important? And and one of the reasons why is with that review article, um, more and more of uh, the studies that are done on salt tolerance in amphibians are done from the perspective of applied ecology. What does that mean for changing environments that uh, are related to rising sea levels and more frequent and more violent coastal storms that are gonna flood coastal regions that previously were brackish or maybe stayed freshwater depending on the topography. And also, what does that mean for the application of road salt in places that uh, in, uh, in the United States that um, apply heavy amounts of road salt during the wintertime come springtime, that road salt doesn't go away, it gets washed <clears throat> off of the road surfaces and into the surrounding um, um, shoulders and the surrounding habitat and how does that influence water chemistry and how does that and influence those amphibians that breed in those pools that would be found roadside. Um, just quickly acknowledge all the students that have helped me over the years and acknowledge uh, the Katie National Park staff that has been very supportive of my work and um, and I look forward to next field season. So with that I think that um, with that incredibly rapid overview, I will um, um, entertain any questions. And I guess, Abe, do you come in here now? Yes, uh, thanks okay. a bunch, Steve. That was, that was terrific. Um, it was a great overview of the natural history going on there. And I'd encourage anyone um, that has questions to go ahead and put them in the chat or um, or uh, if you if you want to, I we can try. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to just unmute yourself and ask, uh, maybe mm -hmm. switch back to the chat if we end up talking over each other. But yeah. feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask. But I um well I'll wait for a minute and see okay seconds and see if anybody has a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I have one to start if if nobody has one, Bernie. questions from the audience yet um so what all uh a question that i have is is so i guess there are a lot of questions i have but the um yeah. one kind of basic one is is like in these exposed pools and and given that the water clarity is so high um are like are they uh are they exposed to higher like lower food supplies or or higher um higher predation rates there do you suspect or have you seen seen any evidence yeah. of that? yeah that's a good question because one of the uh um uh 
benefits of breeding in vernal pools is that by definition, vernal pools lack vertebrate predators. Uh, they're fishless. Um, down at Otter Point, as I said, that uh, most of the pools, there's only two pools on particularly dry years, including this past year, that will dry up. But the pools uh, form by both um, uh, seep that I see coming down from, uh, uh, from above, as well as you know, uh, a surface runoff when it does rain. And it's enough, even when you get prolonged periods of time where it doesn't rain, there's enough seep of groundwater that keeps those pools hydrated. Um, but um, I've never seen any aquatic predators in there. I see seagulls, gulls sitting on the rocks there. And I have, I have seen, I've observed dead salamanders uh, picked apart. And whether uh, gulls are doing that, um, I don't know. Um, it's not outside the realm for a mammal to come down there at night um, and be able to pick off one of those salamanders. Um, but I've never found any scat down there to try to place a particular species of, of um, mammal down there. So I don't think that there are high predation rates that, um, that uh, influence their uh, uh, viability um, just because of their exposed. And in terms of food, that, you know, uh, at a brown bag lunch that you hosted a number of years ago when, I forget the, uh, I forget this, the person's name who was doing work on, on pools over at Scooty and, and was looking at um, Daphnia, copepods. And uh, he told, and I went up and talked to him afterwards. He said, I'm sure your pools are filled with, with, with copepods. He said over at Scooter Point, over at, yeah, at um, Scooty Point that, they're, you know, they're there in, 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 in abundance. He said, I'm sure that's what they're feeding on. So um, I never went, you know, and tried to quantify that. Um, but, um, but the other thing is, you know, they're, they're carnivorous. So um, I didn't mention this, but spring peepers, only in passing, spring peepers also breed in those pools. And I can't help but think that they're eating spring peeper tadpoles. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep. No, that, that was great. Um, so we've yep. now got a handful more questions and so right. we'll kind of work through right. those. Uh, Ken, do you want to yep. do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I was going to say I can address Ken's question. I, I'm reading it on the chat here. Um, and the quick answer is, is I could show you slides. And if we have time, maybe I'll go to them. I sort of put them on the end here about what about the larval and the egg stage down there. Um, I did in 2017, I had a student and funding to follow larval development at Otter Point because they can't leave the water. And, and what about uh, larval survivorship and development? And the quick answer to that or summary of that is that um, at least in 2017, storms seem to settle down. So all of the pools remain basically fresh water. Even when there was a coastal storm, um, it wasn't of an intensity that could up the salinity level. So throughout the entire summer where the student went down and measured salinity levels, and then also looked at, um, looked at uh, larval develop development in the form of of uh, uh, total length, like how quickly it was growing. Didn't look at survivorship, but just developmental rate um, that all of the pools were basically freshwater. There wasn't any variation, but within any one of those freshwater pools that there was a great range of larval development that did not seem to be, you know, loosely correlated with salinity, that larval development, you know, was the rate of it was being dictated by something else and it could be food supply and it could be individual variations. Some larvae are just more fit and able probably to obtain food than other ones. So um, I concluded that, and I, and I sort of informally have followed up on that, but the bottom line is, is that come late spring, early summer, the, uh, my sense is that the Otter Point pools stay fresh water. So the larval uh, salamanders are in a different um, habitat than the breeding adults are, even though they're in the same place. Egg survivorship, I haven't looked at that because really the only way to address that is experimentally. It would be taking egg masses 
um, from Otter Point and putting them in an experimental setup where you can uh, look at uh, salinity levels or the, the response of egg survivorship in different concentrations of salinity. And I haven't done that for two reasons. One is that doing so obviously go, could impact the viability of that population uh, over time if you take a lot of eggs and you need a decent sample size really to have a robust um, a statistical assessment of what's happening. And the other thing is that the literature is pretty clear, regardless of the species and regardless of the other life phases, that all amphibian eggs are highly vulnerable to elevated levels of salinity. And eggs, as they're developing, can't osmoregulate. They can't do anything about the influx of salt or the loss of water because they're just an egg. So egg survivorship is uh, across the board is um, really low and even in, in relatively low concentrations of salinity. And I'm gonna say that I think around two parts per thousand is where you start to see notable um, mortality in eggs. So I, I, I sort of feel like that that question has been answered and, I, and, I, and, and there's, um, unless reviewers of a paper insist that I do this, um, no need to duplicate that for the spotted salamanders down at Otter Point. Um, so Charlie's question about spring fed or rainwater. <clears throat> yeah, I didn't mention that at the outset, but I did mention that I think it's a combination of, of the, the pools form initially from a groundwater seep and from rainwater. And are there other coastal sites? Um, I don't know about the island, but I've gotten reports that uh, people have seen either salamanders or egg masses in similar type pools over on Scudic Peninsula and have talked to Alexa about um, um, going out there. She had the time and the interest um, in the spring to see if indeed that's the case. Right now I'm tied up down at Otter Point and it'd be hard just for continuity of data for me to pick up another study site, but uh, it could be there in the future. So, um, so I don't think that Otter Point is, uh, is unique, um, but how widespread it is up and, up and down uh, the coast of Down East Maine, I don't know. Um, all right, Dave Feldman's question about my 60 minute time period. Was it long enough? Um, uh, my protocol was uh, predicated on other behavioral aversion studies that used one hour because initially they used 10 minutes and, um, and their study showed that 10 minutes is too short of a time to elicit um, the appropriate response. So they expanded it to an hour. And I feel confident that an hour is enough exposure because <clears throat> when um, you, I have seen both down at Otter Point, and I mentioned that one salamander uh, that I had excluded from the analysis because it wasn't eliciting behavior that was um, typical of the other, other 47 salamanders. And that salamander was in 17.5 parts per thousand. And it clearly started exhibiting distress behavior. It had uncoordinated movement um, within that container. It tried to get out, but it couldn't for some reason. All other salamanders had no problem exiting but that salamander couldn't for some reason. So, and the onset of that behavior was about in, after about 15 minutes. And at the end of 60 minutes, um, we took it out, uh, we didn't intervene, we kept it in the 17.5 um, to see if it could get out, but it never did. But we took it out and it clearly was distressed. We put it in fresh water and within 10 minutes it had recovered. And I've seen down at Otter Point that, um, that uh, uh, at times uh, when I've seen salamanders that were in some pools that were up around 18 or 20 or maybe 22 degrees, part, or not degrees, 22 parts per thousand, they were in uh, osmotic distress too. And not always because I don't like to intervene with nature, but a couple times with students, it was just hard to see them 
in that distressed state. So we removed them or moved them to another part of a pool or to another pool that was fresh water. And the same thing within 10 minutes, 15 minutes, they recovered. It's amazing um, how quickly that can happen. So I think that, I think that uh, the effect of, um, of, um, of the uh, habitats um, salinity concentration or the difference in osmotic concentration is pretty quick. And it's not surprising because of how permeable their skin is. Um, I fear that a longer time in salt water could uh, cause significant morbidity and mortality. And um, I've been assuring the park that that would not happen to their, to their park salamanders. Um, let me just, okay, Bruce and Judy, oh my goodness. From, Oh, about crossing the roads. One of the, I think, um, uh, 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 distinctive parts of or aspects of my study site is the fact that the Park Loop Road is closed during the breeding season. If it wasn't closed, I quite frankly don't think I could be asking the questions that I'm asking because I'm really looking at the influence of elevated solidity by way of the Atlantic Ocean. But if the Park Loop Road was open at that time of year, to I'm speculating here, it may also involve the park maintaining that road by the application of road salt. I don't know if you do that or not, but because it's, it, 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 that doesn't occur, I really think that um, the influx of salinity when it does occur is only coming in one direction. The other thing is, especially in terms of site fidelity of the mark recapture studies, is that with the Park Loop Road closed at that section, that I am assuming that I'm not seeing any loss in return from mark salamanders because they're, they're, they become roadkill. And, um, and I know from being out in other parts of the island um, in the springtime during spring migrations that uh, road kills can be significant and um and i often go out to schooner head road and um and depending on the night and and usually what works in the salamanders and the wood frogs favor is that that spring migrations kind of peak on really crappy nights rain driving rain and which keeps people inside, but especially Schooner Head Road. But even on nights like that, when I'm out there, I see cars driving uh, to and from Schooner Head Overlook. I, I know people live out on that road, often wondering what they're doing. But if they are out on those nights, there can be significant mortality. It, um, there's, there's no two ways about it. Um, this past spring with the, uh, with the uh, uh, state shutdown, I went out. I sort of defied our governor's uh, stay-at-home orders. And when um, the research was suspended in the park, I was out um, on the island and, uh, and I was the only person out. And uh, you could just see how um, the difference, just the salamanders were crossing the roads. I did not see any mortality. It just had a whole different feel to it. I still helped them across the road in case that odd police car would come by, but um, but uh, it, it but anyway, roadkill, especially um, when it involves um, amphibians crossing roads to breeding pools that would be roadside, uh, uh, can be significant. And having said that both in terms of minimizing application of road salt and minimizing roadkill. Um, I'll just put in my plea to the park to never, ever, ever open up the park road before April 15th. <laughs> well, I think that's a good, actually a, a good place to, to end um, kind of management implications. I think um, I totally, yeah, it's, it's tough to see when they're crossing roads and, and when there's trail yeah. and just, yeah. did we have a spot. Yeah. And it kind yeah. of makes me just... clear too, if we, um, if, if some of the reason, if, if we looked more in these kind of 
just above high tide rock pools in the down east region if we might find more populations like this i mean your your research kind of suggests I, that that would be have you done yep. that kind of a survey in the past no i haven't no i haven't and you know i'm really thinking that there's all kinds of tangents from this survey yeah. or from the study that i've been doing and i think in my <clears throat> in the coming years it'd be great um to survey um, or work with, you know, say like Eagle Hill or um, or you know the uh, Audubon chapters to survey, um, you know, these rocky coastal regions in the early spring and see if there would be, um, you know, other populations, uh, um, you know, in a similar ecological situation. And and I bet you, I, you know, I, well, I know it's just not Otter Point because I know something's going on to some degree over at Scudic. And I bet you there are other places too. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, thank you very much, Steve. This was great. I appreciate you um, taking the time to, to present this and, uh, and definitely look forward to keeping in touch on, on the work. And um, if anybody has any follow up questions, feel free to let Steve know. And, um, and also, I will uh, send an email out when we are able to post this, uh, post the talk. So thanks a bunch, Steve. Really appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you, Abe, and thank everybody for tuning in. And I know it's more time in the computer, so I really appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. T take All right, care, you're everyone. welcome. All right.